Um, yeah, I, I usually work on uh, quantum field theories and uh, uh, quantum many body systems. And so I was actually quite pleased when Ignacio gave me a green light to talk about a problem that has been on my mind for at least 20 years. Uh, the problem is definitely older. There are some papers about it from the 1960s. Perhaps the problem was already known to John von Neumann. Uh, so it's a problem very uh, basic in quantum mechanics and uh, it sort of got completely forgotten. Otherwise, I think somebody else would have solved it before us. And so this is work in collaboration with Munir Al-Hashimi and has uh, been published in two preprints. Um, actually, the work is so simple conceptually that uh, even bachelor students can write theses about it. And so I have currently three bachelor students, Immanuel Albrecht, Jan Hermann, and Valentin Wies at the University of Bern. And some of the work that I'm discussing here is actually there based on their theses, which are not even written yet. Okay, so the problem is really to understand the momentum of a particle that is confined inside a space with impenetrable boundaries. And so if you have a particle in a finite volume and you would measure its momentum and apply the standard concept of momentum, the particle would end up in a plane wave state which extends all throughout space and it would no longer be inside the volume that it's supposed to sit in. And so um, that may therefore not be the appropriate uh, momentum concept for a particle that is really permanently confined inside a finite volume, even after a momentum measurement. And it was simply not known how this uh, new momentum concept could look like. So um, just to give you a rough uh, overview of the outline after a short motivation, I will remind you of the somewhat subtle differences between hermeticity and self-adjointness. And this is really key to understanding this uh, problem. And then I will introduce the new concept for the momentum operator that we developed. And this whole talk is essentially just about a particle in a box. So everybody in his or her education in quantum mechanics has encountered this in one of the first lectures. Um, but uh, the subtle issues are usually not uh, discussed and there is a lot of confusion, I would say, even in the textbook literature, certainly on the internet, in different forums, there's a lot of uh, confused discussions about this problem. Um, once we have this new concept, I will um, show you that the Heisenberg uncertainty relation naturally generalizes to a finite volume and there are uh, additional terms uh, that show up. Also the Ehrenfest theorem, which relates the time derivative of an expectation value of a position to the momentum is valid only when this new concept is applied, but otherwise not. And then at the end of the talk, I will show you a um, simulation or that which one of the a bachelor students uh, programmed and you will see some wave packets bouncing around between the walls of a particle in a box um, and um, you will see the new momentum concept at work in this case. Okay, so um, how can I motivate this? Uh, there are real systems that are confined, for example, uh, ultra cold uh, atoms in a box trap, in an optical box trap. Uh, electrons in a quantum dot, um, or for example, in particle physics, uh, there is a phenomenological model that describes the confinement of quarks and gluons inside a cavity, which we call an MIT bag model is sort of old fashioned because now we have lattice QCD and can do this better. But still, this model also relies on a uh, perfectly impenetrable boundary condition for the quarks and gluons inside. And then if you go even beyond the standard model of particle physics, there's a lot of speculation going on concerning additional spatial dimensions, which might end in a deep brain or something like that, which is also an impenetrable boundary of space in this case. 
So there's some motivation to think about confined particles. And uh, we need a little bit more quantum mechanics than most of us have been told in the introductory courses. We all know that we can define a Hermitian conjugate of some operator A, a dagger, and by definition, it acts on some bra vector in the same way as the uh, original operator A acts on a cat vector. So this is just the definition of a dagger. But we also need to keep in mind that an operator typically cannot act on all square integrable wave functions in the entire Hilbert space. For example, this operator A might be a differential, a differential operator, and then the wave functions on which it can act better be differentiable. So there's always some limited domain, some subspace of the entire Hilbert space in which the operator can act in a meaningful manner. Um, and then, of course, we know what it means that an operator is Hermitian. It just, just means that the operator at a dagger defined up there acts in the same way as the operator A without the dagger on the wave functions that are within the domain of that operator. Now, what we should really care about in physics are self-adjoint operators, because physical observables require not only hermeticity, but actually self-adjointness. And that means that the domains of the operator A and A dagger must be the same. Otherwise, it is not guaranteed that this operator has a real valued spectrum of eigenvalues or a complete orthonormal set of eigenfunctions. So usually in physics, uh, we don't need to care too much about these differences between hermeticity and self-adjointness. But once your system is confined to a finite spatial volume, this is absolutely key and uh, is sort of at the bottom of what uh, our solution of this problem uh, boils down to. So let's uh, consider the standard momentum operator, the partial derivative with respect to the position. And it has a domain uh, which contains differentiable wave functions. And since this operator should map us back into the Hilbert space, after taking the derivative, uh, the result should still be square integrable. So this is fairly standard, pretty harmless. But now we want to put this object, this single particle, in a finite interval extending from minus L over 2 to plus L over 2. And first, we care about hermeticity. And this we have all done uh, in homework exercises in quantum mechanics. Uh, by definition, we inspect the uh, dagger operator, or we can say by definition that's the same as P acting on Psi, and then we do a partial integration. We bring the derivative back to uh, the bra uh, wave function chi, and then in a finite volume, we generate a surface term. Now, the surface term has to vanish, otherwise the operator is not even Hermitian. And indeed, we can uh, make this surface term vanish, for example, by saying the wave function should go to zero at the boundaries, which is completely standard Dirichlet boundary conditions for a particle in a box. However, then we put the burden of the boundary condition entirely on the cat vector psi and the bra vector chi is still totally unrestricted. And that means that the domain of the dagger of this operator is actually bigger, is unrestricted than the domain of the uh, standard momentum operator itself. And that simply means that this operator is Hermitian if we put the wave function psi to zero at the boundary, but it is not self-adjoint. So it doesn't uh, serve as a physical momentum operator. And then as uh, it has often been concluded that this means that momentum is simply no longer an observable quantity in a space with impenetrable boundaries. And that's essentially where the story ends. People have just agreed that this is not possible and therefore uh, work on other in interesting uh, problems. Now, uh, we are going a different way. We are saying what we can conclude from here is just that this minus id by dx is simply not the momentum operator and we are looking for a alternative concept for the momentum in a finite volume 
Okay, uh, let's also look at the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian doesn't suffer from such problems. Uh, it can actually be self-adjointly extended, as it is being said, and so we can do the same exercise here. We have like just the standard single particle Hamiltonian, if you like, with an additional potential in, in addition to the box potential. Uh, and then again, by doing partial integrations, we have two derivatives, we do two partial integrations, we generate a surface term. And then uh, the surface term has to be zero in order to ensure the hermeticity of the Hamiltonian. And it turns out that the most general boundary condition that allows us to do this is a so-called Robin boundary condition, where a linear combination of the wave function and its derivative is put to zero at the two boundaries. And there are two parameters that uh, determine gamma plus and gamma minus that determine the linear combination. Now, if I use this boundary condition to replace the derivative of the wave function in this expression here, I can actually pull out psi and I am left with something in the brackets that involves the bra vector chi. And therefore, uh, the burden of the uh, hermeticity is not put entirely on psi this chi also has to obey a certain condition, namely that this bracket has to be zero. And this is actually the same as the condition on psi if this parameter gamma plus in this case is real. And this just means that this Hamiltonian has two real valued self-adjoint extension conditions, parameters, and so we can define two real numbers to specify the boundary conditions on the left and the right end of this interval, and we will get a wonderful self-adjoint uh, operator. If this parameter goes to infinity, then we impose Dirichlet boundary conditions, which is sort of the standard, what we all learn in quantum mechanics, but we could also put the parameter to zero, and then we would have Neumann boundary conditions. The most general ones are these Robin boundary conditions. And this is not just mathematical uh, tricks. It has uh, important physical consequences. It just means that the probability current uh, vanishes at the boundary, so no probability current flows out of this interval. This is, of course, important for unitarity, and uh, it, however, doesn't mean that the wave function itself must vanish. It could uh, uh, just vanish in combination, uh, linear combination with, it, with its derivative. All this is completely well known, uh, but maybe not to everybody who uh, uh, knows quantum mechanics quite well. So let me show you the energy spectrum of a particle in a box. And uh, here on the x-axis, you see this parameter gamma, which goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. If it is plus infinity, you see here the energy spectrum of uh, what you learned in your first class in quantum mechanics, the ground state, first excited state, and so on. As we vary this parameter, eventually we reach uh, gamma equal to zero, then we have Neumann boundary conditions, the ground state has zero energy, and then as soon as we go to negative gamma values, there are even negative energy states, and ultimately if we go to negative infinite gamma, we have uh, two negative energy states with infinitely negative energy. These are the corresponding wave functions. Uh, here on the far right, you see this textbook case with Dirichlet boundary conditions, the completely standard wave functions. If you put this parameter to zero, you have a constant ground state wave function. If you overshoot and make gamma negative, the ground state becomes a hyperbolic cosine. And if you go to very negative values, you get something that is completely localized on the two boundaries. The wave function could also just be a linear function, as in this case for the first excited state. So the, the particle in a box is quite a bit richer uh, than what we typically learn in our uh, introductory quantum mechanics lectures, but all this is fairly standard. Um, so now what's the problem um, with the momentum? Um, it is simply not uh, a self-adjoint operator if you use the standard definition. And um, we wanted to uh, uh, solve that problem. And the key to the solution is really 
uh, to discretize the space at least for a while and then return to a continuum description later. And um, uh, the motivation between, behind this discretization is really the following. Can I interrupt for a second? There yes. was actually a question on, on Slack. So the question is, if the problem can't be tackled by treating the particle in a box as the limit of more and more confined potentials. Yes. So, so the, uh, indeed, one could say there is no problem of this kind if we are willing to talk about the rest of space as well. Um, if we would say, okay, the potential is not infinitely high, it is some kind of smoothened out function, um, then the problem is in principle going away, except that the mathematical description is then uh, quite a bit more complicated in the sense that you are now dealing with all the rest of space, which is essentially not important here. Um, if you think of cases where you really literally say that space ends, like in a, a extra dimensional beyond the standard model application, then you can't even do what you're proposing. But indeed, it is a mathematical idealization and it is very tempting to describe a box trap by a hard wall potential to describe a quantum dot by a hard wall potential. And this is common practice. Everybody does like this. And so you can continue to do this and we'll now give you a momentum concept that is completely adequate for this situation. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the, the idea was that uh, this somewhat subtle differences between hermeticity and self-adjointness, they disappear when we uh, go to a finite dimensional Hilbert space. These subtle problems arise only because the Hilbert space is infinite dimensional. If I discretize space, the Hilbert space is finite dimensional and um, the differences between uh, hermeticity and self-adjointness simply evaporate. Um, so, and then the problem really jumps into my face because the momentum operator on a lattice is really naturally described by a finite difference. And the finite difference can be taken either in the forward direction or in the backward direction. And these two things are different. Um, they are not Hermitian operators. So the, the non-hermeticity is sort of obvious once you put yourself in a finite dimensional Hilbert space. But then um, you can actually form uh, a, a Hermitian and therefore self-adjoint combination of the forward and backward derivatives. And it turns out to be some matrix here, a finite dimensional matrix. You can also combine these objects, the forward and backward derivative to form an anti-Hermitian operator. So since the momentum is not Hermitian, uh, it is clear that it has a Hermitian and maybe anti-Hermitian part, but the real crucial question at the end is, are these real and imaginary parts truly self-adjoint operators in the continuum limit? And what is very important to notice here is that this symmetrized forward-backward derivative actually is a finite difference over two lattice spacings. And therefore, if I want to evaluate the derivative of the wave function at an even lattice site, I have to consult the values of the wave function on the neighboring odd lattice sites. So this even odd structure of the lattice uh, is important in this construction of appropriate Hermitian uh, momentum operators, even in this lattice situation. And uh, this is sort of a rem reminiscent of staggered fermions. If you are a lattice gauge theorist, then you know what I'm talking about. Otherwise, it won't help you to understand better what we are doing. But the crucial observation is, in a sense, that uh, um, the momentum uh, cares about high frequency modes, uh, which the Hamiltonian usually doesn't care about. So there can be differences between even and odd lattice sites in a lattice, and they are important for describing the momentum properly. And especially if the world ends abruptly at the boundary, this is a very ultraviolet sensitive situation. 
And so here, um, we now want to talk about the situation in the continuum because this is the standard way to talk about quantum mechanics. But we still need to maintain this concept of even and odd. Of course, in the continuum, there are no even or odd lattice points. Uh, but it can naturally be dealt with, just like in staggered fermions, if you take the continuum limit there, you develop a two-component wave function. And these two components are somewhat artificial as far as the actual uh, original problem is concerned. So if the wave function is the same on the even and odd components, that's what we really care about. But the momentum needs the doubled Hilbert space. Otherwise, you can't write the Hermitian operator. And sort of this doubling of the Hilbert space, which uh, is motivated by this lattice consideration, is really the key to the solution of a problem. And then you can repeat your exercise. So the momentum uh, is actually off diagonal in this double Hilbert space. And then you can uh, again uh, convince yourself that the hermeticity uh, requires the vanishing of some surface term. But now the surface term involves these two components, the even and odd components, both of the um, cat and of the bra wave function. And the uh, boundary condition uh, that leads to a self-adjoint momentum operator relates the even and the odd components. This is actually similar to what happens in an MIT bag model as well. Um, and then um, if I impose this condition on Psi, I don't put the entire burden of the boundary of the hermeticity on the cat vector. There is again a condition on the bra vector. And that condition is the same as the one on the psi's. If these two parameters here at the boundaries, there's a lambda plus and a lambda minus, if these are now purely imaginary numbers, then we have constructed an honest to God self adjoint momentum operator. Can I interrupt okay. you again for a second? So there, there was actually a, a question on the previous slide, no, not the previous, actually the second previous uh, one. for that. Uh, one one back actually even one more okay oops i think yeah about these solutions like the question is it was posed from jan von delft if the solution with infinite negative energies is physical uh yeah this is a little bit tricky i would say um uh if you literally go to gamma equals negative infinity then i would say you get some mathematical problems you are somewhat going out of the Hilbert space, but you can make gamma as negative as you wish. But mm -hmm. it is a tricky limit. I mean, I wouldn't dare to go literally equal. I, I dared, but I didn't really mean it like this. Yeah, OK. OK, so um, now that we've doubled the Hilbert space, we have to also put the Hamiltonian into this doubled Hilbert space. And the Hamiltonian itself doesn't really need this. And therefore, we add here a projection operator. And we have a parameter mu, which we will choose very large. And it will simply exile the states uh, uh, that we have got in order to be able to talk about self-adjoint momentum and push them to very high energies. This is what this projection operator p minus is doing. And once we've done this, we can apply again the machinery of self-adjoint extensions to this Hilbert, uh, the Hamiltonian that now acts in the doubled Hilbert space. And uh, we should impose boundary conditions that support the states that are actually the ones that we care about, namely the ones of finite energy, which have the same upper and lower component in this doubled Hilbert space uh, at the boundaries. And uh, this then leads to a restriction on the self-adjoint extension parameters. And then it comes quite nicely that then uh, this problem is completely equivalent to the original one in the original Hilbert space. Uh, and we recover the boundary, the boundary conditions that we had before. So this just means that this new momentum concept can happily uh, coexist with uh, the standard Hamiltonian. So okay. um, there's actually one more question. So okay. let me try uh, to I see. I get very far, but uh, I guess 
I will then have the five minutes. Uh, yes, again. exactly. You will get the five minutes. I should extra. be so glad. I'm so happy that uh, there are questions. So of please. course, if you prefer to keep no, them no, until I, the end, I, I can also I do that. I don't. But I don't. Please. I think it's better in between, in, indeed. So it's from Simone Warze. Um, and uh, she's asking, so in, in some sense, the fundamental object for the translation operator is the translation group. Stone's theorem provides a one-to-one -one correspondence of self-adjoint operators and those groups unitarily realized on Hilbert space. Uh -huh. And the question is, how does your unitary translation group look like for your choice of the self-adjoint generator? Yes, so I prefer to refer to exactly this paper. <laughs> it's a subtle question. I fully understand, uh, and we show how the John the the Stone von Neumann theorem is satisfied. Uh, although it seems paradoxical, it is true, and we show it in this paper. So it would, I, and I'm very happy to discuss it more at the round table, maybe. But it it's a longer discussion, and therefore maybe we should postpone it a little bit. But the question is very good, okay. and I can answer it, but not okay. within a few sentences. Yes, let's move that to the round table then. Okay, okay. thank you. So now we have a self-adjoint operator and uh, we can uh, figure out its spectrum. The momenta of this operator are quantized. They are quantized in units of pi over L is the box size times an integer. And the wave functions are, the eigenfunctions are known. And then we can say, let's take an energy eigenstate as we learn it in quantum mechanics uh, let's pick the wave function psi 7, which is the six excited state. And uh, naively, we would think it has a, a momentum, two components, uh, uh, pi times 7 over L and minus pi times 7 over L. But that's not really the right answer. The momentum spectrum is richer. And um, yeah, so here we can really uh, say with what probability would we measure what value of the momentum in this completely standard eigenstate of the particle in the box. By the way, this continuous red line is what you would get if you would apply the standard concept of momentum, which actually pushes the particle out of the box after the measurement. It has a continuous spectrum and it doesn't respect the impenetrable boundary, but it is not totally different from our new concept. Okay, um, then I promised you a generalized uncertainty relation. Um, and uh, actually, uh, of course, this is due to Heisenberg, but then Schrödinger made an important contribution and if you take these two contributions into account together, you get a formula that is much simpler than what we usually learn, where we have a commutator. And here I have derived this relation for general operators A and B, which aren't necessarily even Hermitian, let alone self-adjoint, because I will apply this now to the standard position operator and the standard momentum, the derivative uh, operator, which is not the proper momentum, but I can use it and I get an uncertainty relation, which is a valid mathematical relation, which we actually derived together with Munir more than 10 years ago. But we were puzzled by it because we couldn't interpret it because it involves things like the, ex the, the expectation value of this derivative. And since this is not a self-adjoint operator, I can't say this is what you get after measuring this 100 times and averaging over it. But now, in terms of the new concept, all the expressions in this uncertainty relation get a physical meaning. So this relation becomes interpretable in terms of measurements that you actually perform on this confined particle. And in this generalized uncertainty relation, there is not only the expectation value of this self-adjoint momentum operator, there is also um, uh, the wave function values at the boundaries, the self-adjoint extension parameters of the Hamiltonian, and so on. But it all has now a physical interpretation, which was very nice because this was not input. It reassured us that our concept is actually appropriate. Um, 
then one can within a few lines show that the Ehrenfest theorem applies. There's again a surface term. And if you apply just the standard concept, that surface term is in your way. Uh, but with the new concept, it all works out. Okay, and then sort of for your entertainment, I would like to show you an animation of a bouncing Gaussian wave packet. Uh, here you see uh, already a snapshot of this Gaussian as it hits the wall. The wall is infinitely hard, impenetrable, so it induces high frequency oscillations. And here in the top panel, you, you see the coordinate space wave function or probability density as a function of where you are in the box. And down here, you see the momentum distribution. That is the distribution of this new momentum, the probability distribution. It's a histogram because the momentum has discrete eigenvalues. And you will also see here the uh, expectation value of the position and of the momentum in the moment uh, of the uh, simulation. So I'll now start sharing something else, um, namely this little thing here. Uh, like this, and um, I hope you see this now. Uh, there's an annoying green box. Do you, uh, do you see this correctly? Or what do you, I see something strange. Do you see this yeah. correctly? We see the video and then there's a, a green box, but it doesn't really, it's not a big problem. Do you see the full, full Gaussian? Yeah. Or do you see only the interior of the green box? No, we see the full Gaussian. Okay, then you see what I see. Please try to ignore the green box. I will now uh, set this in motion. Here is a Gaussian. It will start moving to the right. It will bounce back and forth. Here is the momentum distribution. It will also move around. And uh, so the momentum distribution is the one that you get based on the new momentum concept. And I'll now let this go. You, so you see that this... Gaussian is bouncing around. And for example, if I stop it, uh, you see the high frequency oscillations. And uh, this is really uh, almost the end of my talk. Um, uh, this takes another minute or so. And it uh, shows one quarter of the period of this motion. Now, a particle in a box has uh, uh, eigenvalues, energy eigenvalues that are integer multiples uh, of the ground state energy. Therefore, this motion will definitely be periodic. I will show you one quarter of the period here. I've stopped it at one eighth of the period. Um, and um, um, and uh, after half of the period, the Gaussian would simply move in the other direction. So the last 30 seconds of my talk, I let you guess what this uh, will do after a quarter of the of a period. And um, we are almost there. Um, I have asked different people to guess what might happen after a quarter period. Until now, nobody got it right. But we have very smart people here. Uh, so I stop it and uh, you see already what's happening. Uh, we'll see a double Gaussian. And um, so there is a wave packet. Uh, um, screen sharing has stopped. OK, then I go back to the original thing. Uh, OK, here. And uh, so we saw the double Gaussian and uh, the conclusions are that we have a new momentum concept. We can now deal with impenetrable boundaries. They are mathematical idealizations, but they are wonderful idealizations. We can now uh, work with them. We have a generalized Heisenberg uncertainty relation. We have, again, the Ehrenfest theorem, which sort of got lost uh, without the new concept. And actually, which I didn't talk about, if we go to higher dimensions, there are novel features of quantum mechanical momentum that are quite interesting to explore. Okay, thank you very much and sorry for going slightly over time. 
No, it's perfectly fine. We interrupted you all so many times. So thank you very much for this very nice and clear presentation. Uh, just one last question, and then the other questions we can um, take in the roundtable discussion. Um, also by Simone Watzel again, if you square this momentum, what is the corresponding, uh, well, what is the spectrum of the corresponding kinetic energy? Yes, yeah, so, so again, a very good question. I mean, the, if you just look at the differential operator expressions, uh, I mean, if you look at this momentum and you square it, you get a diagonal moment derivative squared, and it looks very much like what you have here in this uh, Hamiltonian that acts in the double Hilbert space. But this is actually misleading because the domains of the Hamiltonian and of the momentum operator are in general different. And therefore, uh, the square of this momentum is not really the kinetic energy. So these are very important uh, issues. And um, this is uh, sort of um, not familiar to most of us, but uh, you who asked the question, I think knows about this very well. So you may not be surprised by the answer. OK, thank you very much. Uh... Yeah, so I just encourage everybody again to then join the, the round session for further uh, round table for further discussions. And then, um, yeah, thank you again for this very nice uh, presentation. And I think we should move on to our second speaker of the session, which is Daniele Oriti, um, a Heisenberg Hello. Group 